So I've centered the questions today around several themes, again, related to Dr. Savitz's presentation. So the first theme centers around knowing when to take action. So we saw two controversial examples today in which there was epidemiologic evidence of harm that was likely biased. Yet this can be challenging to explain to the public, and we often hear from advocacy groups who want any potentially risky exposure eliminated. So my question for you is how um, does your organization or field balance protecting the public from uncertain harms with avoiding fear-based recommendations or unnecessary action? <laughs> Who's going to kick it off? I'll start. Well, I think that part of it is um, something that I think that you talked about in your talk, doc Dr. Savitz, and that it has to do with, um, as epidemiologists, you know, having our methods down and knowing our role, but always striving for interdisciplinary collaboration. So we have um, represented on our teams and helping to shape the communication um, providers who in the relevant medical fields or healthcare fields, you know, patients who are affected by the condition. Um, and biologists who study the underlying biology, policy experts, et cetera. And so we can't have all of those on every team, but I think that to the extent that we can work with folks from these different disciplinary groundings and sort of get their perspectives, that can help us provide a more balanced take on our research. If I could ask some of the people who work in health department settings in particular, and I've, I've had limited experience in this, but the, the challenge of saying that what you know, in some appropriate way, what you were worried about is really not worthy of worry. People do not like to hear that message. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's because they're feeling that they, your job is to worry about what they worry about. And how to sort of manage and respond to that without simply, you know, I mean, again, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen it done poorly where the, the, you know, there's an exaggeration or a placating or I don't have an answer to it, but I'd be interested in sort of that general challenge of where the evidence really does not warrant a action for the protection of public health, let's say, and yet the public concern is there. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, so welcome to my world. Um, it is a really fine balance and in sort of the, the general rule is redirect to the significant risk. Um, you know, most recently, I think the, the one that just pops to mind, and Amy's probably going to do a meltdown, and I mentioned, but lead in water. Um, yes. No amount of lead is safe. And, and you acknowledge that, and it, but it's an opportunity to talk about actual risk, and, you know, and risk in paint, risk in hobbies, uh, risk from ceramics, um, but again, it's a really fine line because, especially in a case like that where there's a great deal of media attention, um, there is a strongly perceived risk. Um, you have sometimes very photogenic, very outspoken people in your population who are suffering damage, that, that there's real damage, but for whom there may not be or is not or is shown to not be a definite correlation with the perceived risk that their risk came from somewhere else. Um, this is where the, the linkage with the communication specialist, with the risk behavior specialist becomes really, really critical um, and, and working between the hard data and, and the more, uh, the softer sciences, if you will. Yeah, and I, I think another big thing, especially the local level, is, is really about trust building in the community. Mm -hmm. Because when people have fears and have, are looking for answers, and, and frankly, you know, we are probably most of the time acting on imperfect information. <laughs> There's really very few times I can think we act on perfect information. Um, so I think coming from a place of trust, uh, messaging that um, has authenticity to it, um, and uh, building, you know, building that 
takes over time as well. It's not like one scary thing can happen and you're automatically the expert on it that people are going to listen to. But if you're in a community day in, day out, you're, you're showing up, you're in for the long haul, you're maybe providing services, there's trusted service providers um, out there, or you've been convening groups, um, you know who the right spokespeople are um, to help uh, communicate a message. Um, I think that that really, there, there's not a great substitute for that piece of the trust um, of, of it. And, you know, and people do want stories. They want that personal, you know, if you're talking about cell phones, it's like, well, you know, can we ever say a risk is, is non-existent? Maybe not, but I'm going to keep using my cell phone <laughs> if that makes you feel any better. <laughs> you know, so so getting um, personal about things um, can help. Um, and, and again, finding the right folks to, to present those messages. Um, I also think it's understanding those fears and expectations. And really, I mean, uh, you know, one of the examples that we deal with pretty regularly is um, around immunizations and not, um, not blaming parents, but really trying to understand that, you know, most parents are trying to do the best things that they know how to do for their kids, um, how they're reading something or understanding something or balancing what they feel like their kids' risks are. I will tell you, nothing got us um, higher measles uh, vaccination rates last year like Disneyland. Like, you know, all of a sudden people's calculus who are sort of in that in-between zone really shifted when they thought about that. Um, so even though there was some, you know, fear there with immunizations, and there's definitely going to be, you know, conspiracy theorists who you're never going to satisfy. I think that's the other thing that you know, you have to accept, but it's also laying the groundwork for folks who really want to make a well-informed decision. If I can just comment, you know, it's really interesting because I, I had always resisted the what would you do question or what would you do for your family or what would you advise, you know, if, if, you, know, if you were pregnant, what would you do, et cetera. Because I always felt like, I, you, know, you know, I would say, no, you want to know what a rational person would do if they had a complete knowledge, and that's, I'm no more rational than anybody else. I have my own, you know, I'm not going to take a private plane anywhere because that would scare the heck out of me. And that doesn't mean it's, you know, the right answer. But it's interesting because in a way, the ultimate distillation, if, you, if it's in the right situation of what would you do, is to say, look, I, I do know what this is about. I'm concerned about my health, my family's health, and I'll drink the water. I'm fine. It's interesting because, I, as I said, I used to resist, and I'm starting to open up to the idea now that that's a, that's a nice, relevant way to summarize. I've looked at the evidence. I'm concerned about my health, and here's what I would do. I, mean, I think the only thing you have to do is watch out. As I said, we all have our uh, less rational uh, behaviors. I'm, I'm not risk-averse on a lot of things where I probably should be and vice versa, but I think when you're in the right range, though, I think it probably is a powerful statement. I have kind of a tangential story. I'm listening to these, and it's bringing back this very bad memory of <laughs> being pulled into, as the epidemiologist and a lot of our students are here, you can end up in funny places when public action is um, you know, eminent. And I was subpoenaed to testify in a murder trial, um, to, which is a story way too long for this <laughs> panel. But I was subpoenaed as a cancer epidemiologist because a a uh, plant that was now no longer um, existent had dumped very toxic materials in the soil in a, in a town where I actually worked at the university. And they, the civil suit had failed because the company who owned the plant was the country of France. And it turns out you can't really sue France. So they decided to mount this murder trial. And they wanted to have childhood cancer and actually have some childhood cancer cases linked to the exposures that were in the, um, where they were sequestering these materials. So that's an extreme example of having to use very imperfect data to try to answer, you know, respond to what is ostensibly a public health action from a very different, um, you know, area. So, you learn fast you know, when you're in those kind of situations. I was, I was mentioning a, a social media example. Somebody had asked about social media, and I was um, 
sort of talking about the social media. Who, how many people in the audience know what the Oregon Trail game is? Raise your hand. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So that, that game recently had, like, I think it was like a 25th or 30th anniversary or something like that. Well, we last winter had a large Shigella outbreak, and, and it ended up actually getting transmitted from the general population into the homeless population, who were very vulnerable um, to Shigella in a way that the general population wasn't. However, the fear of people who were homeless, um, especially there was a very large encampment along a, a, a sort of walking bike trail area in Portland, um, and it led to a, um, actually a physician in the area saying, somebody has Shigella dysentery on the Springwater Trail. Somehow that got wrapped around dysentery in the Oregon Trail at the same time <laughs> and just became this really ex explosive thing on social media about there somehow being dysentery along the Springwater slash Oregon Trail. And so it was really interesting sort of going through that forensic and kind of like looking at like what was the real fear-based part of it around people being afraid they were going to get something from the homeless population where in fact it was the antithesis, right? That the homeless population was actually more vulnerable. Um, and so walking that through, getting the messaging together, working with our um, public information officer who's quite brilliant um, and, uh, and, and working that through uh, around that kind of fear-based social media explosion to kind of like, it's okay, it's okay, <laughs> you know. I, I guess, maybe if, I'm sorry, the other thing I was going to ask too is in terms of what can academic epidemiologists do to help in these things? I mean, you're, I can, communications people can help a lot. Uh, you know, there's a lot of media people, there's a lot of that, but is there really anything that the academic epidemiology community has to offer in, in the nature of the research, the way we present it, even our role in communicating it uh, within, you know, f for the purposes that you're describing? I mean, part of this is a historical piece, and that is part of the story was that we have public health surveillance. Like, it is a job. People have been doing it mm. for like 100 years. <laughs> it's not really academic anymore, mm. but like having that solid history, like there's schools of public health. People are trained to do that. Yeah. You know, like it actually is a big part of the story in a general way. Mm. But you may have some other. No, I, I think that, that that's a, a, a very key piece of it is is tying together. And I, I the, the folks here at OSU have heard me lament sort of the, the separation of the academic and practice worlds, um, the, the lack of active uh, knowledge and understanding. I mean, so there's about 2,800 local health departments in the country, most of which are very small. Uh, a significant number are, are tiny and frontier in nature that they have, really have no ability inherent uh, ability within themselves to, to monitor literature, to know what's going on in research. Um, most, most health departments in Oregon, a tiny minority even have a professional epidemiologist. Um, so both the ability to know what's going on, to understand and use um, epidemiological research is very limited. And so I think, uh, I think OSU is on, on a great track with the, uh, the extension service uh, outreach model with the, with the model that, that this uh, new school uh, has been predicated upon to really do some interface there to get uh, linkages both between faculty but between uh, and, and that and have graduate students out that both provide some of that capacity in small uh, departments, but also to, to educate and bring up to speed public health professionals in those departments who don't have a strong background in, in epidemiology and epidemiological interpretation. 
And actually, I'm going to give one very concrete example to you, linking a, a more hopeful example. And I'm actually looking right out at the example right <laughs> now in the audience in front of me here. Um, we actually have an OSU PhD student who's mm. helping us work on a mathematical simulation of the Shigella outbreak and looking at the interventions for it. So I think that's a really good example, actually, of bringing in you know, what is very technical work. We also have a PhD mathematician working on the project with us, um, you know, to build that team and do that kind of work. And that does add, again, to our credibility, um, both with our policymakers and, and others, to be able to have that connection with the university here and what is some pretty um, technical work. So this is a great discussion, and it's kind of morphing into another theme that I had uh, raised, which is interpreting epidemiologic evidence by non-epidemiologists. And so we've touched on, on some of the points that I was interested in, but in hearing you all speak, um, so I'm interested in, in discussing how much it's on epidemiologists to understand media relations and public policy, and I'd like to add to that about how we can incorporate that into training. Um, because we're here at a College of Public Health and Human Sciences, there's a new school of public health up at OHSU PSU. So, thinking about this, how do we incorporate that into our training? Well, I, I will say that I really like one of the points from the the talk that we just heard, the amazing talk that um, around thinking through the different methods and finding sometimes the right method for the right question. Um, I mean, I think there's some other things, too, that we'll be potentially touching on, like uh, administrative databases and different mm -hmm. kinds of data study designs. What do we do with the world of electronic health records and some of the other data source questions linked to that? But in terms of the training of, of epidemiologists, like how do we take the really awesome technical skills that people are learning and then move that into a world where like you probably don't always get a chance to like do the perfect study all the time yeah. <laughs> so you know how do you use what you'd have what are the data cleaning skills that you can you know get uh you know understanding sort of what you have to work with um the biases are are, are many and have to be really well understood in constructing those kinds of studies yeah. so I think integrating that into some of the training I, mean, I think that you know one of the things, at least to me, it, it touches on too, though, is that th this business again of the stories we tell to our peers, our colleagues, and, and to our students, and to then people from you know in other fields or in the community or in other, and how to sort of. Um, I, I think a lot that there is a lot of uh, motivation within the purely academic world to uh, aggressively promote positive findings. That's how you get the next grant, uh, you know. Submit. You don't say, oh, this isn't really a very interesting area. Not much is going on. It's kind of dead issue now. But let me, you know, let me have a million dollars to do another, another study. It's always, we're, we may be on the threshold of a disaster here, and my latest findings make a compelling case that this is a pressing issue, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that th there is, you know, an incentive in, in the sort of the promoting of this, and I certainly see colleagues who will even at the most cynical this is the, the the worst of academics if you will but who will try to manipulate the public concern to promote their academic agenda their professional agenda and i think it's it's not quite maybe as cynical you know cynical as i'm describing because they genuinely believe that they've they've gotten a calling and they're gonna uh be the, the you know the community advocates and fight against those there's, there's terrible health department people who aren't being responsive and who are denying the problem, et cetera, et cetera, the sort of the, the, uh, the, the, the alarmists. Um, and it's, you know, again, it's, yeah, I don't know, you, you can't, you know, suppress freedom of speech there. But I think that part of the problem may be that there is not sufficient amount of um, sort of weighing in from the, 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 you know, the, the, the more uh, reasoned and reasonable academic community on these issues that, you know, I'm sure you take something like lead and, you know, there is a wide, there's a big consensus of most people in the field about sort of the where things are and there are extremists who are uh, pushing uh, pretty aggressively that, you know, 
you know, for, for impractical sort of approaches to managing it and so on. And at least I think that it's, you know, it sounds like there is a good system evolving here of right, you know, from the point of view of student training, what, what could be a better experience than saying, okay, we've got this issue, we need, the, you know, kind of more input than our staff can provide or you don't have the time or the expertise, and we would like you to get involved and weigh in. And I think drawing on faculty that way and so on, it's actually quite rare that um, many of us are asked to sort of weigh in and, and, and comment in that regard. And so I think it is a, it, you know, it goes both ways. We've got to be willing to do it because otherwise the academics who will make the noise are not the right ones, if you will. That's pretty extreme, but it's not always that way, but it's a, it's a real danger that those who are on a mission, uh, researchers on a mission can be a dangerous thing, let's yeah. put it that way. And I really agree. I mean, my thinking on this has really evolved. I um, didn't become an academic epidemiologist so that I could communicate to the press about my findings. It's not my passion. I didn't think that I was very good at that. And in fact, I think a lot of the really rigorous doctoral training that we do kind of trains against that. You know, it's not about, um, it's about really being detailed about the rigor of your methods and, you know, the whole literature leading up to your question and precisely what you did. And that's very much not what the press wants. Um, but I really um, have really changed on this. And I think that your rationale is the one. Just that if we don't message our studies fairly and clearly and to the, you know, to the mass media and to the public, but um, that, that leaves other people with, with agendas that isn't science to kind of do that work for us. And so I think we do have to do that. I think that even if we're not, um, that's not our main skill set, our, our main motivation, we have to pursue that training and build up that skill set so that we can do it. And I do think that it should be integrated into our doctoral programs as well. At the at the risk of um, really destroying what little dignity and uh, <laughs> credibility I have with our students, I have another story <laughs> about this. All is bringing such bad memories back. If you don't, um, I'm not naturally a person who's going to respond to a request for an interview. It takes a lot to get me to that point, and I wasn't really trained. I worked as a um, public health practitioner for a while, and then. Um, through a series of one bad decision after another, ended up as an academic. <laughs> but the, I never really got formal training, but I was constantly having to deal with these kind of hot button issues. And there's one I remember not, this is a, 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 um, a story, what is it when you're protecting people? This is a cautionary tale. This is a cautionary tale <laughs> to not turn those down because I was involved with um, archiving newborn dried blood spots for a state that will remain nameless. And it spun into this e enormous legal issue, which was not related to the murder case. That's a different story altogether. <laughs> but I wasn't responsive to requests to know more about this, this registry, this archiving of these dried blood spots, because I thought, this is, a, this is a nothing issue. This is not, not a big deal. The newspaper headline was Researcher Selling Baby Blood. <laughs> so that was a, a lesson to me. Wow. Always respond to the request for information. But I think at, at our academic level, what we're trying to provide are opportunities to get that training. Because there is, there is a whole discipline and field of communication and risk communication that uh, doesn't that overlaps with epidemiology, but they have techniques, they have strategies, they tell you what to wear, how, you know, how to try to control the message, and we need to give our, our students those kinds of opportunities so that you don't ever be accused of selling baby blood. <laughs> <laughs> I was not. I was not. <laughs> I was just archiving it. That's too Yeah, it's, you, you, can't control, but mm. we've all been there. Mm. Um, one, one way or another, you know, you do a, a, a the best communication, um, the best synthesis of information, and somehow there's two or three words in there that get pulled the out. The throwaway line. Just, when the throwaway line becomes yeah. a story, I did that one too, Don Everton. Um, <laughs> but a piece of it really it is is that kind of cross-disciplinary, uh, you know, we, 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 in practice and in academia, 
um, we, we sort of balkanize our, our specialties. Um, and the health behaviorists, the, the health communication people, the, the rigorous epi data and biostatistics folks, um, the, the academic tracks touch each other, but there's, there's not a great deal of interaction. And that sort of penetrates out um, into the world and, and as people under practice. And it's great to have, have specialists, but I think some appreciation um, of what specialty, what different specialties offer, how they can be leveraged, how they can be utilized. And sometimes I, I think it's a matter of, yes, you know, you may be asked a, as an epidemiologist, but utilizing also whether it's another specialist to, to back up your statement or be alongside you, or even, heaven forbid, a spokesperson or sort of a face. Um, you know, we all sort of cringe when we see a celebrity advocate in front of Congress or in front of, of, of a legislative committee. But those people are, are effective. And decision makers and the general public respond often inordinately, usually inordinately, um, to a, a charismatic story or a charismatic spokesperson. And we can use that as well. Um, you know, it, a, a legislative committee will be um, response, many often many times more responsive to a single archetypal example of the results of a study. <coughs> A person, a kid, um, than to reams of discussion about confidence intervals and, and biostatistical methodology, um, and and it's often our our opponents who understand that best and utilize that most effectively. It's interesting though, because it does lead though to the. You know, again, I, the, the, of course, as an epidemiologist, I, there's nothing I like less than the. Uh, the odd anecdote, you know, the person who drowned because they had the, the, the seat belt on and the 90-year-old who smoked three packs a day for their life and shows that it doesn't really necessarily cause all that much harm. And sort of the, um, gosh, I mean, I think, though, that, you know, the issue of, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, the, the examples, as I said, I do worry about it. I have, you know, the, 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 the danger, I know that in New York, the, the fracking policy was being recommended by uh, Lady Gaga and Yoko Ono were the ones that were basically saying whether fracking was a good or bad idea. Now, I'm not sure that they're the best sources necessarily. I, I don't usually look at their opinion on, you know, things of that nature. But again, they're, they're you know, they get a podium and they're, they have a forum. And especially, even though the example, the, illustra the illustrative case, you know, to me, the most persuasive evidence is what bores the public completely, is some authoritative committee looked at all the evidence and came out with recommendations. You know, the American Academy of Pediatrics or whatever says, okay, here, we've looked at this. Here's what we think is the right, you know, clinical approach or the Preventive Services Task Force or the a CDC panel or National Academy of Medicine or, you know, a National Cancer Institute. And people say that's like a non-news, oh, that's, you know, that's some faceless, you know, bunch of bureaucrats or whatever. But in reality, of course, it's the synthesis of collective wisdom that has really taken on, you know, a really methodical look. It's just so remote, though, from the media doesn't care about it much. They want the, they'd much rather hear from the renegade investigator who's going to be the whistleblower. Or they'd rather hear from the affected person. And it's sort of... Um, you yeah, know, it's, it's, it's very uh, difficult to know how to have the same sort of splash for the truth. It, it's, a, <laughs> it's a tough line to walk. And I, just real briefly, I would say, it, to me, a piece of it goes back to, to a comment in one of your slides. I can't remember if it was a slide or your comment about being right in spirit but wrong in fact. <laughs> and, and I think that's what Amy was getting at. Um, yeah. and, and often... Um, we are not the best ones to bring that forward. And, and it could be a spokesperson or an illustrative case might do that and acknowledge the risk of any lead exposure, but right. this, right. what 
what we really need to be worried about is. And I, you know, thinking of training as as well around this, and and again, there are phenomenal people out there working as uh, you know risk communications and and public information officers and and whatnot. Um, actually, there's a lot of really good public information officers since a lot of newspapers have closed down, but um, sadly. Um, so, uh, but I do think that there is something. And, and I, this would be my little controversial thing for the day <laughs> as an epidemiologist, that I do think people need to think about the, how their results are going to be spun. Um, because who, you know, who are sort of the winners and losers? And, and you hate to think of it that way, but you know, if you look at what happened with, you know, with big tobacco, you know, every, st every day is a new day against big tobacco, right? Because they are gonna be the losers <laughs> um, in, in most public health policy that has to do with tobacco. So you know, how are you always kind of understanding that? Um, you know, there, not only do we have to work with people, but I, I I wonder, and this is sort of more the, the questioning part of this, is like how do we maybe sometimes need to go back to look at our own information to make sure you know we you know we have done the the best study that we can do at the time um, that we're not releasing you know dribs and drabs that can just just sort of get spun out of you know with with no context around them, and I and I think that that is worth um, thinking about. Um, as, as professionals who are in an area where you do live in a world where causality is, is a matter of accumulated evidence. Um, and also just recognizing that media, it, it's not that they necessarily want to go for the for the for the outlier that is necessarily always the whistleblower, but they but they like conflict. Conflict is news. So, you know, thinking again about how to how to frame what is going out there in a way that is, you know, builds your trust is is always um, the. I thought it was a really interesting question too about being respect like uh, explaining but not talking down. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I can't, all I could think of was as a woman going to get my car fixed. I was like, it's not just about being a scientist, right? It's like different people, you know, I could go to a mechanic and they might really talk down to me. And I just don't know that much about cars, but I still don't want to be talked down to about cars, right? I mean, you know, there is an element on, on you can have the technical knowledge and you can still speak with, uh, respectfully about it. But then also sort of thinking about that um, in, in the context of your findings and, and thinking how others are really going to look at those and accepting that um, there are going to be people who don't like them. And then you just have to figure out, well, what do I say when I know they're going to say they, they don't like it or they're going to make a different decision? I think there's a whole pipeline. It's interesting, too, because the question of... Uh, you know, first of all, what topics need more research? Is more research truly? I mean, it's it's, it's made it somewhere else. We're going to you know, mention that, but it's so. Is the research capable of helping? Is the quality of methods we can bring to it going to be beneficial, regardless of the outcome? Not you know, you don't do research to generate ammunition for pre-chosen outcome. It's not the nature of research. And really, I think a lot of things we topics we would not address if the research is not going to be helpful in some way, and or the methods are so limited that research will just add more noise and controversy. Don't bother, based on the methods. So I think even before you do the study and get the results, there should be some very thoughtful consideration. And then you're right in in the presenting of the results and even the technical nature of the presentation, and then continuing on to the sort of the more uh, wider dissemination of it. That, you know, in some ways, I think that it almost you have to really think about it even an earlier stage of that before you embark, because some of them are just not headed down a good path. It, it's just there's, it's a question people don't want to answer, you know, here, here answered. It's not, I mean, some issues I think are genuinely not, uh, and very legitimate questions, the answer is not research. The answer is some kind of action, intervention, uh, support, uh, service. You don't need to do the research to sort of uh, show that there's, you know, there's a problem or be responsive 
they may couch it in terms of we need to know more of this and we need to know more of that. What they really mean is we want something and maybe that's what, you know, where the discussion ought to be. So uh, your point's well taken though. So I think we'll take audience questions at the sure. end. Um, so uh, this discussion is really leading into another theme that I had identified, which is really the relevance of epidemiologic investigation. So do you think in modern epidemiology, are we doing the studies to generate the information that will really have an impact on decision makers? Or are we just doing research that other epidemiologists <laughs> like? I, you know, again, I can comment. I think that, and this is really maybe a bit more of a sort of more mechanical than you had in mind, but we do the research that NIH likes because NIH funds it, OK? So we do research that informs medical practice. That, that's a, I mean, I've got a study going now that it's clinicians need to decide these things, and if we do the right studies, they will be more, you know, better able to know the right thing to do. That, that is always well received. I had hoped and had fantasies and never seen any real evidence of it that there would be an analogous push for public health research that answers important public health questions. And CDC would be the logical agency, and at one time they made noises about actually having a funding program analogous to NIH, where instead of being oriented around biomedical research, you know, research to inform medical care and understanding of human biology, which is what NIH does, they touch on public health, but that's not their core mission. Uh, the CDC might have a corresponding program where it's all about research that will guide public health. And with rare, you know, there are individual exceptions that pop up, but there are not opportunities. And we academic researchers respond to funding opportunities. Uh, and there is right now not an entity that is pushing for the kind of work that we're talking about that would in, inform this. Uh, it's not a complete void, but it's not a very pretty picture in my view. Just one example of that is climate change. Yeah. And of all of the things that CDC focuses on, they have this much money for climate change, and they currently have none, actually. Um, the, the continuing resolution that was just passed uh, in the latest funding, uh, this, the Senate bill holds uh, CDC's climate funding flat, which is inadequate. And, <clears throat> um, tiny, 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 the House side zeroed it out. Um, so until there's reconciliation between those two, and I think the deadline is December 10th or something like that for reconciliation, um, CDC can't spend any money on climate change. But that's just one example of where CDC's hands are tied um, by politics and it's one area where of all the things CDC does, they never, ever, ever have talked about prevention. So everything to do with climate change in public health has been about adaptation and mitigation, and they, CDC doesn't touch climate footprint and, and uh, carbon load and things like that. Um, I mean, the one exception, I think it's interesting because, again, they. And you also, I thought you were going to use an example of, you know, issues related to gun violence. Well, and, that's... We, and again, uh, Congress uh, has a very tight hand in... They give NIH, they, they sometimes get upset with what NIH does, but they give them a whole lot more latitude to figure it out for themselves. Periodically, they, you know, recently they were intruding on NSF, you know, and deciding that they were reviewing the proposals and they didn't... <clears throat> the Congressional Committee didn't think they had the same merit that the expert panel thought. So, you know, you get into those situations. But there are, you know, the selected sort of counterexamples, I think, about what the Gates Foundation does within particular realm and on a large scale, but it's all about public health. I mean, they will work on other, you know, technology and many other areas. They want to actually go out and how do, what do we need to solve these big problems? And it's, you know, I wish there were, only wish there were more in a broader array of uh, entities that would be pushing for that kind of research. So maybe in thinking about focusing our research, um, the next theme I want to bring up is when to say when. So <laughs> when is additional research not helpful? So in the two examples today, there were persistent sources of bias, and additional research would likely encounter these same biases. 
So how do we decide as scientists and practitioners that the evidence is sufficient or despite the insufficiency, we're not able to make meaningful progress? I think that one's tricky from the academic side because there's a certain pressure to, um, I think of it as academic recycling, to use the information that's already there for maybe a large cohort study or publicly available data that is, um, you know, it's cost effective to do one more take on a particular topic. And in an academic setting, there's um, an undeniable pressure to produce publications and um, you know, grant proposals and grant funding. So, um, you know, the common t t term is always low, the low-hanging fruit. And I think it would take a, a culture shift to that combines the a different way of funding with a way of looking at some of that higher-hanging fruit that might be more complicated, um, more complex to get at, but more rewarding. Um, I think, I, I think, I think that that is the challenge. Is that, like David said, NIH um, funds biomedical research. I mean, that's the reality of it. And I've experienced that as a cancer epidemiologist. The focus has been on small changes in DNA for twenty something years, and mm -hmm. um, which was never particularly interesting to me. For about five minutes, when it first came out, I was like, "Oh, cool, maybe no." <laughs> it's just not I, I, because I got into this for prevention, and there's not uh, short of um, very scary futuristic options for genetic control. There's not a lot of that we can do other than identifying high risk populations. But you have to sort of embed that in something else. If I want to identify a high risk population that might have a prevention strategy, it has to be within a, a sort of genetic. A GWAS study that's identifying this and that and the other in the genetics, and then I sneak it in. I actually had a, um, a paper a review that was looking um, looking at birth defects in their relationship to childhood cancers, and and I had framed the 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 study as possibly high, possibly leading to a prevention strategy for leukemia in Down syndrome kids. And the reviewer wrote back and said, I'm really puzzled by your language about prevention. I said, what? Why are you puzzled? That's the ultimate goal. And so that I broke my own rule of being uh, a very uh, mild in my responses to, you know, I was like, yeah, what's the point? What's the point of doing this if it doesn't eventually lead to a prevention strategy? But I don't, our main funding and our main um, pressure points don't reflect that. You know, there's there's maybe a shift towards translation, which is a, a way of thinking about it. And then we can un, you know, then we can open the door to um, personalized public health, which is a whole nother area that's um, f fraught, I think. Um, but I think in a, in a nutshell, the culture that academics work in is not geared towards at least academic epidemiologists. It's not really geared towards prevention. It's, it's more about understanding mechanisms and, you know, untangling uh, very naughty balls of ca causal mechanisms uh, for multiple etiologies. Yeah, no, I, I think, too, and I agree, Sue, that, the, the, you know, the challenge of sometimes the barriers to prevention can be, you know, more mundane things like getting people, you know, to engage and mm -hmm. communicating and things that to the biomedical world seem like, well, that's not very theoretically interesting. It's not going to break, it's not, you know, really cool science in that sort of perspective of things. It's just, it, it, it goes down that pathway towards being of more uh, logistical and practical. It's sort of in the realm of, in some cases, just using some basic knowledge we have in more effective ways and can we make it more effective and that would be a very much of a cdc mm -hmm. or you know or again in the gates world for their issues more of that kind of thing it's um yeah you know it it's it, you know, the, the the other thing i think too is that in terms of the expectations i don't want to make it to, nih does fund work that is you know a lot of really great epidemiology and but i think that one of the challenges too is is making sure that what we are capable of doing 
is enough of an increment to be worth doing. And I've been on this sort of bandwagon lately on environmental issues where uh, environmental people love to keep doing research even long after it has uh, very little incremental value. Uh, and if they can get the money to do it, of course, for the reasons you said, they'll keep doing it. And I was involved with this. Again, I won't go into the, the, the details of that. That's a whole other talk. But a, a panel I chaired uh, at the you know National Academy of Medicine on uh, looking at, I don't know if you remember from when you were in North Carolina, Camp Lejeune and drinking water contamination and all these issues. And the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registries was doing this study. And we looked at the whole situation. We said, stop. What you're able to do is not going to help. Just compensate the people. Stop doing research. You know, you're not going to get any further because if you could do methodologic work, if work that was so sound that it would really definitively answer the question being asked, namely, did these individuals suffer an elevated risk of disease? Well, great, but you can't. You never will. It's, you know, the exposure ended 25 years ago. Just stop doing it and move on. And, of course, nobody liked that, ATSDR especially. You shut down somebody's cash cap. That's, <laughs> That's right. The, 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 everybody, basically, everybody hated the answer for a while, but then they sort of came around over time. But that business of only doing research where it helps, and I don't just mean helps the career of the investigator. I mean helps something bigger than that. But doing it where it it helps. And that's, I think you're saying, you're giving the flip side almost. I'm saying, don't do it if it doesn't. And you're saying, wouldn't it be nice to have funding opportunities if it, where it does? Yeah. And, and they do sort of, you know, they, they kind of go together. And I think my, uh, when I hear that, you know, doing, doing research where it makes a difference and where is additional research not helpful, it's not that it's not helpful, but uh, child immunization safety, child vaccination safety, you know, it, it, the only thing that that these meta studies that come out every couple of years, you know, retrospectively looking at, you know, 4 million vaccinations here, or 20 million kids there, um, and proving once again the safety of vaccines, maybe it gets it into the news cycle for, for one cycle, but it's not changing anyone's mind. It's not moving the needle. Um, it's very self-affirmative to those of us who already know the answers, but it, it accomplishes nothing, and yet it so that's, keeps happening. Yeah, good example. Do you think there's a question, too, about the types of studies you use in different settings? I mean, I, I will say certainly in the local and state levels, I think people – do just have to act on imperfect mm -hmm. information, as we've talked about before. But it doesn't mean that you don't keep evaluating what you're doing when you're acting on the imperfect. So, you know, maybe it's also a shift in your study design and your questions that you're asking when you have to sort of jump into that fray. You don't need another basic risk study, but maybe you need to start thinking about how to evaluate when you've just sort of gone forth with it. You know, I mean, pertussis is a really interesting example where, yeah, I mean, the new vaccine's really safe, but how effective is it? Meh, you know, like there's there's a lot of, you know, ongoing sort of assessment in some of those areas that it's, it's a different question than at that point, but you're also just sort of moving with the times. And, and that evaluation is important because you can't always get to the perfect information like ahead of time. So, um, yeah, I mean, implementation yeah. research of that sort can be extremely valuable. It's, you know, you, know, you can keep fine tuning and it's going to, you can imagine it would have very direct implications for next year. The way you do the program may look a little different if you learn it. And there would be that incremental knowledge that would continue, but maybe not the basic sort of work. I mean, the work on even the immunizations, if there are, if there are variable strategies for increasing the, uh, you know, the uptake, well, let's do some experiments. Let's try some things. Let's examine and analyze those. That's what's interesting, not the question of whether vaccines are safe. We've answered that one. And I think that, um, no, you're, I, I agree entirely. Yeah, and you, and you can use those epidemiologic skills, that understanding of bias, the understanding of your sample mm -hmm. populations. Just because you're not studying causality, you're studying something a little bit different. Well, you are, but it's but you're same. studying causality of programs. Well, yeah. You're studying, exactly. and again, that continuum from you know, sort of fundamental disease etiology, yeah. uh, you know, the, to, to get away from that value judgment that somehow that's, that's like, I don't know, that's, that's more scientific or more uh, uh, prestigious 
And it is within the NIH world, don't get me wrong. But even there, though, honestly, even there when they change the way they deliver medical care, that's considered fair game. And I think the world's moving with us on this. To the so what can be, well, if we can do this more effectively, we will, you know, save lives, you know, save money, uh, et cetera. Uh, not just that we want to do this research so that we can advance the you know, knowledge of human biology. Right, because some of the most interesting questions, I think, that are still left have to do with not sort of the, the fine-grained, causal, etiologic mechanism, but why, when we see that, the results don't transport, why they're not generalizable, why we can't actually design programs sometimes that are effective in combating those outcomes. And that's, in a way, as you're saying, it's also a causal question, it but it's one of transportability, and it's also really important for actually getting our findings so that they actually improve people's health in the real world. Yeah. So I do want to... Oh. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that, I mean, I think the other thing, and, I, and this will kind of merge into the next maybe question, too, is, and it, and it does overlap with the funding and is somewhat unfortunate that we can't do it more, but I think just the willingness to take risks, you know, mm -hmm. try really different things, they may not work. You know, look at a data source that people don't think is maybe very useful, um, you know, put out your idea in a, in a different way, potentially, you know, overlapping, but, you know, taking some risks you know, sometimes you fail, but. So I want to squeeze in one more question before we open it up to the audience. Um, and I apologize in advance because this could be an hour long discussion and I'm only going to give you about three to five minutes. Um, but this question relates to really the boundaries of epidemiology. So with the explosion in the availability and interest in big data, we've seen epidemiologic methods used in different disciplines and for different applications than they were intended. Do you see this as exciting or a cause for worry? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's actually, that was actually what I was thinking about, like when taking some risks, right? I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, data sources out there that have some really intense bias inherent in the data source potentially, but there's something to look at and how do you interpret that? How do you use your epidemiologic skills in, in looking at that mm -hmm. um, in this sort of new, you know, well, not so new anymore, information age, right? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really exciting. I think that I agree both, right? We have to be really cautious and we have to, um, you know, hold research to high standards. But I think that it's not oftentimes with a new data source, it's not about um, yes or no, is it good? It's more about what kinds of questions is it well suited to help answer? And what are the appropriate study designs to apply to that data source? And sometimes maybe it's more of a hypothesis generation purpose or it's, you know, again, about transportability and about in a new population asking a different question. So maybe it's not that, you know, that perfect RCT ideologic question, but, but it's about that match between the question and the data resource and the tools. I mean, if I could, you know, again, it's interesting, I'll pile on with Sue for the, you know, in terms of this sort of unending search for uh, genetic signals. Mm -hmm. um, it's come up a lot in sort of methodology. When I was describing what's sort of in a hypothesis, you know, you, 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 have, a, you have an idea of what may be going on, and you're seeing whether the data are consistent and supportive of that plan. This extreme of, you know, big data, and GWAS is one of the earliest examples of that in biomedical research, it's been around a long time now, lends itself, and they, you know, they sell it as a virtue, hypothesis-free, meaning just who knows what we'll discover in there. I think that in the pipeline of knowledge, that is way, way upstream. That is just, you know, you could say, let's look at everything related to everything and see what, you know, pops up. And it's not maybe an either or issue. If the data are there, people want to use it. But I think that it really is exactly what you were saying, John. I think that the challenge remains, as it always has been with available data, we've got to get it to line up with an interesting question. I mean, so many times, again, and I've been guilty of it, and I've certainly critiqued proposals for it, it's a great data source in, source of a, in search of a good question. And boy, that can really come across. Uh, it's, it better be the other, I always you know, used to advise people when working on proposals, the way it should read is I've got this really compelling question. We really want to know the answer. And look, we found a wonderful data set to do it. If, it, if the tone, if that gets reversed, um, and I recognize, again, there are different purposes to it, but I still think that for most of what we're talking about, maybe I'm being old-fashioned, I still think it's going to be more of the really good question, and, and, and now we've got data to work on it, 
rather than we've got all this data, surely there are some good questions that will answer. I think that's a really good question. I think it's going to become Im- increasingly relevant in the area of public health genomics. So when, when all of our medical practitioners, it won't be far ahead of us, are doing our, uh, doing our entire genome the way we currently do a complete blood count, um, we are going to have big data that, for from public health angles, is is unbelievable, um, and there will be the temptation then to generate maybe not the most relevant questions out out of that amount of data when when that stuff is integrated into electronic health records and becomes de-identified and generally available uh, to public health and we start looking at, at risk stratification in genetics the way we currently do in behaviors, um, the availability of data is not going to be our biggest challenge. I think that the, the one area where, again, in terms of like, I, I don't know if somebody used the phrase, you know, personalized public health, maybe Michelle did, but. Um, The only way in which I see that being potentially helpful, and it's sad to say, I I was saying the same things 15 years ago, but the question came up before of distinguishing between tiny risks and no risk. Mm -hmm. And in theory, although it just has not panned out that way, genetic susceptibility could be the tool to let us distinguish those. So when we then have you know, regulatory standards or we, we're deciding on public health practice, if we knew that that odds ratio 1.04 was masking something we could really work with in a subset, I'm not saying we would target the subset only for prevention. We're not going to say, okay, you can, have, you, know, you can have this much lead in your water, but not you. What we're going to do is say, okay, that, that, that's, that weak signal we saw, well, now it's solid. We know a lot more, and we therefore need to protect the most susceptible part of the population. Now, there's a wonderful story, and it's a great idea. I don't know of any examples where it's panned out that way. Um, You know, know, pharmacogenomics seems to be making a little more headway of, you know, drug selection and even drug toxicity and, and so on. But for public health interventions, for changing behavior, changing environmental exposures, and so on, if it were able to do that, the, you know, the susceptibility stratification, I think it could have rather profound uh, impact. Well, thank you so much. I do want to give the audience some time to ask some questions. So if you don't mind, and again, I apologize for cutting off that really rich question, um, but I'd love to take aud- questions from the audience, and I'll just repeat it so it's picked up on the um, recording. So the question is regarding how do we balance the use of fear in public health messaging as both a, a tool but also something we want to avoid? Do you want to take that one first? I mean, I, I'll, I'll comment on one, you know, again, this is sort of the flip side of it, of the, uh, as I said, I've gotten very interested and I've had an interesting discussion with uh, an economist, a, a couple of statisticians, some others who do risk assessment, risk communication, and so on about why is it that the research we do is not affecting the public more when we, you know, what, in terms of in their, you know, sort of their choice of actions or their interest in what the latest empirical findings are? And we talked about it some in the, the theory that to be salient, that it has to be answering a question that they're asking, and it has to be they will like the information if it reduces anxiety and just sort of. Uh, And so the fear is um, clearly a motivator. The hunger for research and the receptiveness for research may be more driven based on whether it is responsive to those kinds of uh, fears. Um, You know, it's um, very often the problem is the data aren't on our side because we talk about, you know, even to something as simple as presenting a relative or absolute risk, in many cases, we're saying, oh, this will double your risk. It'll go from one in a thousand to two in a thousand. Uh, well, you know, and I, this is where I, I tend to write some of those things off myself, but you can certainly make it a scarier message. You're twice as likely to get it. 
Um, there are very few things we have a firm enough handle on to say that, boy, if you don't do the right thing, you are going to be in big trouble. It's much easier for those who are not so bound by the empirical evidence to instill fear than it is by those of us who are bound by the evidence. Yeah, and I, I guess I would just say, I, I, I mean, fear tends to be divisive. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, as somebody who has to communicate to a community that I feel responsible for, it is a place I do not want to go. Like, I mean, some facts are scary, <laughs> um, especially a lot of people get freaked out about infectious disease um, risks um, in the community. So really, I look at most of my job in the communicating part of it as really stepping back from fear so that people can actually, you know, think through their rational options instead of moving from a place to fear. So from, from my perspective, I don't think it's ever appropriate. Um, which isn't to say that sometimes the facts aren't scary. And fear, fear is also a pretty strong paralytic. Um, you know, if, if you get people sufficiently scared, they will freeze. And so I, I think if there were uh, public information or health behavior folks here, they would say, don't go as far as fear, but if you want to raise anxiety, only do so if you are able to effectively communicate an action along with it. So there's something to worry about, and here's what you do. And here's an achievable, uh, effective action that, that you can take. Yeah. I really agree with um, Amy's point in that I think that there's enough fear, um, especially about health outcomes and health processes. Um, and that other people sort of work to instill that. And, and some people just have some of it, some of it degree of it as healthy and have that naturally. And so it's not something that I work, um, that I, that I work with as I message my research, but something, it, it ties back to what's come up several times on this panel. I think that there's a role for empathy in how we um, study, you know, the populations we study and the outcomes we study and how we communicate our results. So I do try to understand the fears that people um, have around the things that I study and to couch my results in ways that don't exacerbate those fears. But, um, and, I, and again, I think that a lot of that comes down to sort of science and sort of trying to be objective and trying to present relative and absolute measures of association so that you're not feeding into those narratives of fear, basically. Great, let's take another question. So the question here is about, again, communicating with the public specifically around the issue of fluoridation in the Portland water supply, which is currently does not have fluoride in it. Having watched that, <laughs> as both a public health official in that locale and a, and a resident of that locale, I, I mean, I also think it is important to understand that, that epidemiologists are not the policymakers. I mean, they're, they're, you know, people have to make choices and they make choices as groups. And you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, fluoridated or not, <laughs> you know. Um, so I, you know, I just, there, there is a point at which you can say, the evidence is clear, you know, here's, here it is, but, but people, and I don't think there are rational decisions, really. I think people just make decisions from different places. And it's, it's not always the same place that we would land. And at the end of the day, I mean, it'll come back. You know, we will keep trying to fluoridate water. I mean, you see kids who lose their teeth when they're seven years old because they don't have fluoridated water. I mean, that's the side of the story that doesn't get told because of, you know, craft brewer is worried about having fluoride in their water. You know, Portland, there's a historical perspective, too, for the fluoridation thing that is actually very distinctive about Portland from elsewhere around um, our struggle, actually, with the EPA around our water source and our and our what turns out to probably be a pretty unique um, watershed that we get our water from. Um, so there is also sort of a different dynamic to the discussion in Portland that I think links back to the history of that. Um, event or series of events, if you will. But, you know, at the end of the day, you do kind of just have to say, like, we've put forward our best foot. We've, we've gone on the shows. We've responded. We've done what we can do. There's another decision to be made out there. And I think it makes sense to think about, um, this point was made before, about 
sort of the audience that we're trying to communicate to as having being composed of different segments. And so there are some people who really don't um, don't follow, don't know the details. And maybe in communicating our science to them, we're trying to convey, you know, a clear picture of, of the truth as we understand it so that those folks can make decisions. And then there are also people who are just really committed to this a, a particular worldview on that issue or on any other number of issues, especially politically loaded issues. And those folks will often work to sort of distort the science. And so I think that we can think about our work and our words doing double time to sort of provide information for folks that need it, but when, when the scientific facts, as we understand them, are being distorted, there's also a role for us to, um, to put out what, what is true and what is known and what science has taught us. Again, knowing that that's not really gonna change their minds, but at least we can work to counteract some of that, or at least put the facts out there so the facts can do that. I, I, will, I just want to jump one other piece of the fluoride conversation that there was also a cost element of that, and I think because it, it is sort of a, a US city, um, the solution that actually came out of that discussion was dental sealants for kids, which is way more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> However, it's not ineffective. And so when the community sort of made that choice, they were also making the choice not to sort of abandon that kid, as it were, but to say, no, we're going to get them dental sealants. So in other words, it was a different choice that was made that could be they could afford to make. Um, in a way. I, I wonder, though, too, again, generalizing that a little bit, though, I saw another theme in there is when there's a few very vocal people who are uh, wrong. <laughs> I'll try to come up with a better word for that. <laughs> um, but in the political arena, of course, you have a few people yelling at you, and that's what they respond to. And whether it's because the, um, the sort of sane majority is, is kind of quiet and doesn't, you know, you don't have people sort of weighing in like you know saying no that's wrong we we know it's wrong and i don't know how to get it isn't very interesting it isn't a very interesting media story you know fluoride is safe it's not going to get any headlines and i just don't know i i do worry about it though whether it's again you know as i said i'm following this thing with fracking and here's uh, we, here's who we're hearing from and most people would look at it and say oh, it's probably you know pretty pretty much okay and you know you can debate about these you know this or that issue and I don't know how you get, it's sort of that, that it is a worry, though, when the very vocal extremists with or without a fact base have a huge amount of clout in the political process. And you can say, oh, it's because the rest of us are passive. I don't, sorry, I'm going to just keep on this for another minute. But I, I don't know that it's necessarily about being passive, but I feel like when the bulk of people don't feel affected don't by care it. At all. It's they they're like, well, status quo has been working for me. So I don't you know, this this I'm I'm doing OK. So, again, I think that's part, you know, when you're in a, a situation where the status quo isn't working for you, then you don't you know, people are not so passive. Again, it's they're making those decisions that affect their their lives and how many people mm -hmm. make them. And sometimes, you know, what we care about in public health isn't really Sale. driving those decisions for folks. Um, and again, it's, it's also very regional and, and where people live in the context in which they're living. So let's hear uh, from a couple more questions yeah. from yeah, the audience, if that's OK. Um, so, uh, so the question is, are there any epidemiologic um, question, or, uh, sorry, conventions that you would avoid, or, or um, maybe topics, or uh, yeah? Don't bore your dinner guests. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> It's always a good strategy. I have one. Um, I'm glad you asked. Uh, uh, David was talking before about sort of a data set in search of a question. And I find that um, in epidemiology, especially in ep ep academic epidemiology, especially in the past 10 years, I think there's been a lot of leading with a method um, right. because we're methodologists and they're cool and they're fun. And applied to an appropriate question on, on an appropriate data set, they can really help reveal important information. But um, I think that that's a lot of caveats there. And, and I don't think more complicated is not better. And I think that you know, in, in doctoral training or, or in epidemiology graduate training, that is a great time to really understand those methods and how they fit together and what they're for. But, but as you go forward in your research, don't lead with a method. Have, have a really strong question, a really important population that's affected, um, and an outcome that, that matters, and then, and then choose an appropriate method. Great, so let's go ahead and um, I do want to catch some. So let's do it in the back in the purple. 
So the question is, how often do policymakers um, seek out epidemiologists' input? And if it's not all of the time, how can we make ourselves more available um, and, and more likely to be reached out to? Well, they're constantly asking, what do the epidemiologists say about this? <laughs> um, it's it's that, the first, first question they always come up with. Um, it's because of the Ask an Epidemiologist campaign. That's right? it. <laughs> yes. How effective answer, is that? Yeah. That's great. I love that um, social media handle. Let's tweet that. <laughs> Um, we have to insert ourselves. Um, it, you know, there's a number of, of those sort of issues where no one's necessarily going to chase you away from the table, but you're not going to necessarily get an invitation either. And so um, one of the real challenges in a public policy arena is to know what conversations are going on, to be opportunistic, and to to sort of insert yourself and, and the data into the conversation. Um, some will, um, but those conversations going back to the previous discussion are probably more often driven by a, an outspoken uh, issue critic or, or a special interest. And sort of keeping up on that and, and to reflect back to the, the fluoridation discussion, our neighboring community here from Corvallis um, in Philomath abolished fluoridation a, a, a few years ago uh, because of, a, of an interest group um, that got to the city council. And after five decades of fluoridation, they unilaterally uh, abolish that before without even consulting public health, e either local or state level. And we had to insert ourselves in that. We didn't even know the conversation was going on. So let's uh, take two more questions from the audience. So, <laughs> so the question is, um, is po politicizing an issue can be effective in making change? And is that something that um, we should or we can do in public health to help make change? And uh, the public, the people who are on the front lines can speak to. I can do it more from the, the distant perspective. But I think that the, um, the, the the danger in sort of these ideological wars is that first of all we tend to lose them. That, that's one of the dangers in them. You know whether it's anything from you know gun control and on and on and on. Uh, so you could say if, if they worked, I might be more pragmatic and say, what the heck, let's, let's really take it to them and make it a political battle. But in most parts of the country, in most instances, it doesn't work. And I really think that it, 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 it both leads to a distortion of evidence. When you have a political cause, you're not looking for objectivity anymore. You've got a cause. And I really think that it, it's... Public health has this high road of being, you know, as much as possible, pragmatic, data-driven, get the right thing done, being above classic politics for the good of a very simple goal of public health. And I think, if anything, to be honest, I think there's been too much of the demonizing, you know, the, the, the obesity, that's the food industry that did that. Well, you know, let's, let's maybe, of course, contributed, but that's not really the point, is it? It's what are we going to do about it? And I think as much as possible uh, for both of those reasons, because it doesn't work and it's also undermines the sort of the, uh, I think, one of the virtues of public health, which is just all about getting the right thing done. And I, I guess I would draw a distinction a little bit between politicizing and politics, because mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, a lot of public health action has to happen legislatively, whether it's seatbelt laws or smoking laws, um, tax, tax incentives or disincentives. Um, so, I, I mean, I do think that those dangers of politicizing um, probably detract from our role as, as being a a trusted provider when somebody does think to talk to us. Um, but, um, but I think engaging in the political arena to get important laws passed, I, I do think is, is part of the role of public health generically. Now, how epidemiologists fit into that conversation is, is really going to vary, um, you know, from issue to issue. But I, but that is 
completely legitimate, I think, like certainly in government public health, to look at the kinds of legislation that you need to protect people based on the information you have. So let's take our last question up in the front in the white. So the question here, it's a great question, is about um, communicating epidemiologic evidence and methods with other scientists, so other fields who may be using or our methods or, or focusing on the same research question. So how do we communicate with them? I, I would say the most exciting science happens at the boundaries of wow. disciplines. And so you want to embrace that and look for those opportunities. Um, it can be a painful process because <laughs> there's a language. You know, you have to come to a common understanding. And uh, but it's possible. It's it's always possible to get to a point where you're seeing the same problem but through uh, uh, you know different facets of it. And that's where I think the most exciting opportunities are because. Uh, sometimes uh, I, I remember being in a meeting where I asked a very simple epidemiologic question. Had they considered it, that it might be different among males and females? And the whole room just shut down. <laughs> like, uh, what? So I, I think we have something to contribute to those conversations. And the, the outcome can be so rich that um, I, I think we're going to work more with engineering in the future. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's a lot of built environment, exciting opportunities there and disciplines that haven't traditionally been close to you know we've kind of stuck with public health allied health and some of the biomedical but I think there are opportunities in other more technical engineering type fields that we could actually solve some problems together so I, I think it's always been there and always will be epidemiology is collaborative by nature mm -hmm. and it's just being open to new possibilities yeah, I really agree and it, that it's um, exciting and painful, and I think it calls for confidence and humility. Mm -hmm. So we have to have confidence in what we, our way of um, looking at the world and producing knowledge and our science and our expertise in that, and then the humility to show up and to say, I don't understand the way that um, you're talking about this or this language or this process. Can you help me understand that? And um, you know, I think that both are, are called for um, so that we can really leverage those connections and do more exciting interdisciplinary science. Yeah, again, I also, it's interesting though because there is an underlying theme in there, at least maybe it's historically more of an issue than it is now, but the, uh, for more basic scientists, there can be a fundamental lack of respect for the very nature of epidemiology among, you know, that, oh, don't, don't go out and spend money on that. Just go back to, you know, support the, you know, the basic work and it'll all unravel. You're not going to win that battle, by the way, but that's, um, I think that that's where, again, I think there are a lot of other forces that are, that are pushing on our side so that those that want to do clinically relevant, sophisticated clinical research is, is universally recognized as involving a fair amount of epidemiologic thinking and benefiting from rigorous epidemiologic methods. That's not a battle anymore. That's, that's one. And then the other dimension, which, which both John and, and Sue have raised, which I think is really quite, quite important, is finding where the emerging technology or uh, from another field is exactly the way to have the epidemiology take a leap forward. When I talk about it, you know, whether it's in a proposal of sort of the game changer kinds of technologies, if some engineer invents something that hooks up on your phone that measures your radio frequency exposure, I've got a whole new study I can do. Or if somebody helps me develop some easy assay to determine fetal survival at a given point in time, a monitor that, you know, again, I'm, I'm working on a proposal right now. We're potentially working, uh, looking at opioids in hair, working with a forensic pharmacologist. And it's the kind of thing that gets you, it can, it can, it's, it's both fun, and if you can find the right people to work with, it's informative, like, oh, wow, that's really neat stuff. And it can really be this blending of, of the sort of the, uh, across disciplines, across fields in a way that can, I think, just as Sue said, I think it can be a way to make notable progress. We aren't going to get there just talking to each other. One practical example of that right now would be some of the most promising uh, work in, in the practice realm around chronic disease prevention is in community design mm -hmm. and, and public health practitioners working with civil engineers, working um, with uh, county and, and municipal planners, uh, development agencies, 
I, I think that uh, some epidemiological uh, knowledge and, and incorporation in that, some research that actually works with the health behaviorists and, and works with the community designers uh, to either confirm or, or enlighten the work that's going on there, you know, it would be a huge realm. So thank you so much. We should close today just with an eye on the time, but I'm sure the panelists would be happy to um, discuss uh, these topics with you. They'll be up front. Um, so I just want to thank the panelists so much for coming out here. This was a really tremendous discussion, um, tremendous presentation by Dr. Savitz, and thank you all for attending.